Another important example of another of many important examples of power statistics is the theory of bifermions. Very early on, Amunaga pointed out that if you look at sound waves in a gas of fermions, broadly speaking, they look like phonons obeying both statistics. And then later, Cooper pointed out that electrons in certain crystals can pair off and behave enough like bosons to give rise to superconductivity as an approximate version of a boson kind of uh, computation. Well, pairs of fermions are not bosons. They're quasi-bosons, but they're exactly polygons. And the proof has looked simplicity to so it worth presenting. Take the fermi dirac commutation relations and just abbreviate them. They're all anti-commutator relations with p numbers on the right hand side. So they can be cast in this form, which is simply the most general Clifford algebra. So fermi dirac statistics defines a fermi dirac Clifford algebra. And because of the duality between creation and annihilation, the metric which appears here is a neutral one. Signature is zero. So it defines a certain Clifford algebra of the form cliff of n comma n. The generators of the Clifford algebra are simply the two index gammas, which are representations of the rotation group. So the fermion pairs exactly obey Apollo statistics. And this suggests And instead of struggling to make boson pairs out of, sorry, bosons out of fermion pairs, don't you simply accept the fact that they are polygons and study the question of polygon condensation, which must surely exist since the polygon statistic approximates the Heisenberg statistic if the number of particles is not too great, not infinite, I should say. And a certain delicacy would be required because the very idea of a condensation requires very many particles. And the temptation to go back to Heisenberg statistics will be irresistible. One has to study the approximate condensations that are possible for a finite number of many particles. So here I write down different colors to uh, what I've already said. So the immediate problem for the structure of vacuum is to set up a type quantum theory, a quantum theory of many levels. And the stupid way to do this is to take the simplest possible example and follow its model in making a quantum theory. And since we want to avoid infinity at all, at all costs, let me begin with the theory of very finite sets. That's the finite type I'll call them. That's an accurate designation. In that they're made from the null set by a finite number of nested braces and disjoint unions. And I'll call them F for finite. But they're not merely finite. Their elements are finite. And their elements are finite and so on. And that means their type is finite. So they are just the sets of finite types. That set F itself is not a finite type. It's infinite. Mm. But we won't use all of it. We'll cut off at some finite level sufficient for this. Mm. You can also interpret the elements of F as synthesis. A set of n elements in, a set, in an abstract syntax of n vertices. The difference is that these synthesis explicitly have synthesis for their vertices. And they're those synthesis have synthesis for their vertices, and so on a finite number, number of times. In homological algebra, one often expresses a system of any synthesis by adding them. But you express a system of any vertices by multiplying them to make the simplex. Why change? So using a new approach to simplicial complexes, 
in which we are constructed simply by iterating the process of multiplication. And of course, the, the product has a property a squared equals zero, except for the absence of, of addition. One is doing family statistics. Indeed, a family ensemble has exactly the same characteristic property in the set. You can be in it, you can be not in it, but you can't be in it twice, and the order of the things in it doesn't matter for any physical question. So a set quantized becomes a semi-direct ensemble. Semi-direct semi ensembles are quantum sets. Quantum set theory is a theory of the iterated semi-direct quantification process. So it begins with the empty set, which in every field theory is represented by one dimensional subspace, the vacuum, the real axis in this case. I stick, I, I stick to real quantum theory because we've seen that I comes in a kind of singular classical limit of the positive theory in which I is an operator. But the problem is that the, the interpretational problems of real quantum theory were already worked out by Stuckelberg back in the 1950s. So one can iterate the process of taking the exterior algebra, which I've designated by this big back. Uh, Q is the exterior algebra over itself as a result. And this is supposed to be rich enough to represent any finite quantum structure, because I have no other way of expressing what I mean by that. Uh, and it grows with type as incredibly rapidly as classical set theory. The dimension of type T is what I will call the hyper-exponential of T. And by type 6, one has a number which can't be written in the universe in a font size of the Planck length. So it's unlikely that we will need to go above 7 or 8 to do field physics. One of the fundamental elements of the space-time theory. Until now, the only operational definition I've seen for a space-time event is that given before 1905 by Einstein. An event is something like a collision of two small hard bodies. I think we've gone a little further in collision theory. And we have to update this concept of events on which everything is based. It seems to be ludicrous to study the interaction, the collisions of quarks, in a contextual framework fixed by the collisions of stars. In fact, today, if you look at the smallest collisions, they are of quarks, or on the other fermions of the standard model. So I'll call, I'll take as event, the smallest thing we have today, which is going on the collision of our body, it's the input or output, the creation or annihilation of a so-called elementary fermion on the standard model. And it's these that we have to represent within Q and from which we have to extract the orbital coordinates. I didn't notice the time in which I began. Uh, roughly, how much time do I have left? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So first of all, elementary events have spin a half and fairness statistical. And so they should be represented within a graph analogy. Well, we just happen to have one. So the elements of Q will be used to represent the state vectors for these quantum events that make up the world. But they should have spin a half. So we'll interpret the elements, the vectors of Q as spinners. Just for the fun of it, I've written out some elements of Q to give an idea of the structure of finite sets or finite quantum sets. Um, here's the type. And we see the population growing with type 
rapidly by the spreading tree so that a bulk type 4 is not practical to write them. And it turns out that if you list them in the order of creation, they have a natural ordering. In fact, you can think of each of these as a notation for a natural number in a kind of hyper-binary notation. In the binary notation, you use the same base at every position. And here, the base is exponentiated whenever you move in position to be the largest number that you could not express in the previous basis, in the previous positions. So it's the most economical positional notation you can have. And uh, so here are the numbers, and above them are their hyperbinary notations, hyperbinary symbols. You neglect the fact that your diagonal is not unit? Not at all. I'm going to call these, I'm going to take these all to the unit finish. All of them. Um, with the understanding that I use here spinner in the sense of multi-spinner. Products of spinners are no longer first grade spinners, they're tensors over the first grade spinners, are uh, formed by exterior multiplication. And if they're spinners, then all the apparatus for spinner theory has to be recovered. For example, according to Cartan, each spinner space appears as the exterior algebra over something that he called the semi-vector space underlying it. And that means that in this game, the semi-vector space for each type is the preceding type. And you should also have an orthogonal space with a, a quadratic space with an orthogonal group, of which the spinner space is a spin representation. It carries a spin representation. And here, that orthogonal space is the sum of the previous type plus its dual, which is such an important combination, I'll call it the bi-space. The bi-space of the space is it plus the direction of it and its dual. And it's an important step from the fact that in a definite sense, it's the logarithm of the linear operators on the Clifford algebra over the original space. And finally, there is induced a natural, neutral, but symmetric quadratic form on the space of spinners, familiar from Dirac theory, which is called the Pauli form. So I'll call this space of spinners with a Pauli type form a Pauli space. And this is what's replacing not really Hilbert space, but the exterior algebra over Hilbert space in the usual quantum theory. And that immediately requires us to give a definition for the indefinite metric. But no one has any problems with the indefinite metric on spinner space. And Dirac hinted at this long ago in his Yeshiva University lectures. He pointed out that you simply have to recognize that the probability formula of these indefinite metric spaces does not give the absolute probability. It gives the flow of probability, or the mean flux, to the experimenter. There is simply no problem in calling the norms of draws, output vectors, positive, and the norms of cats, input vectors, negative, because ordinarily you never add them. And in all the formulas of physics, the inner product always appears above and below in fractions. So the sign is meaningless. It's only when you consider a space where they both enter, like the by space, that the question of sign comes up. And the new element of this theory is that it suggests that the distinction between input and output is relativistic, in the same way that the distinction between past and future is relativistic in special relativity. So there's no problem about the interpretation. The problem is whether it's true. It's an experimental question. And, okay. Now the first step in the encoding process.